You can be turning in your Bibles if you'd like, 2 Peter chapter 1, 2 Peter chapter 1. Also turn to 2 uh, Timothy chapter 3, James chapter 5, we're going to be in all those. Eventually we will get to them. Uh, I want to give you a little bit of the background, the t- title of the message, if it's got a title at all, it's about, the, it's about the Bible, I really didn't give it a title, but it's about the Bible. I want to read something to you from Max Licato, one of the great writers of our day. He refreshes us in many ways when you read the things that Max Licato has said. And he makes a powerful statement about the Bible, about the Word of God. He says, the Bible has been banned, burned, scoffed, and ridiculed. Scholars have mocked it as foolish. Kings have branded it as illegal. A thousand times over, the grave has been dug and the dirge has begun. But somehow, the Bible never stays in the grave. Not only has it survived, it has thrived. It's the single most popular book in all of history. It has been the best-selling book in the world for many, many years. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 24 and 25 says, All men are like grass, and all their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers, the flowers fall, but the word of the Lord stands forever. I want to emphasize that again. The Bible stands forever. It will never go out of existence. And I'm going to get into some of the reasons why. I also want to be rather practical. I wanted to do this at our our upward devotion, but I just didn't feel like I could do it. But I'm going to be asking some questions. And I'm doing this for your benefit because this is very elementary stuff. And... um, uh, I know some of you will know the answers to these things, but you just don't, uh, you don't want to volunteer what you think they are because you're afraid you'll get something wrong. That's okay if you do. Let me tell you some of the questions that I'm going to be asking you. Are you ready? Gives you a little bit of a head start. What's the oldest book in the Bible? Now, don't, don't answer it yet. I just want you to start thinking about it. What's the oldest book in the Bible? I probably ought to qualify that. Uh, the oldest book in the Bible by date. That is, when it was written. may not necessarily give you the chronological uh, oldest events, but this is one that's been written, the oldest that's been written. Who knows the oldest book of the Bible by events that are recorded? And then how many of you can recite categories of the Bible? Do you know the Bible is written in categories? You've got uh, the Pentateuch, which is the first five books of the Bible written by Moses, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, and it goes on and on and on. And then what I'm really curious about, and I know I have some that can do this, But we've got a lot of kids in here, too, today, and I'd love to have them involved in it if they can. How many of you can name all 66 books of the Bible? All 66 books of the Bible. Now, I want you to stop and think about that because those are some really good and powerful things that can be involved in your own life. Uh, If you know all 66 books, you've been reading your Bible a lot. Listen to this in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 21. I'm, I'm reading this to you and giving you some of the key scriptures that have to do with the Word of God. Because Max Licato is right on. Uh, Go anywhere that you want. Anytime they've tried to stamp the Bible out, they can't do it. And there's a reason why. And this is one of the verses of Scripture that helps us to understand why. It says, For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Very important to understand this. One of the things I'm trying to bring your attention right here, this book was not written by man. Now, I I don't want that to be confusing. God chose men to speak through to write this book. That's what he did. Without inhibiting their personalities, the Holy Spirit of God literally took control of every single of one of the 40 or so writers of the Bible, and he, he inspired them to write down exactly what he was telling them to write down. Now, there's a lot of complications that come into that for a lot of people, but it's very important that you understand that this book comes from God. It's not a man-made book. And then the Bible has a collection of 66 books. They're divided into two major sections. In the Old Testament, there's 39 books. And in the New Testament, how many knows how many are in the New Testament? If you can add, you could do that. Connie, you're dominating it all, 27. She knows, all, she knows the answers to all this. I know i got somebody in the wings that's going to be able to take care of it for me. I'll look to you when I can't get anybody else to help me out. Is that all right? No, no insult to you. We've been together too long. I want you to know there's a lot of other names that are given for the Bible. Or a few other names are given for the Bible. The Word of God. Not only the Word of God, but the Holy Scriptures. 
And those books that are arranged in categories and categories there that you need to probably know about, instead of being arranged chronologically, they're arranged topically. You got the law, which I just gave you, the historical books. There are 12 historical books. The poetical books, there's five of those. The major prophets, there's five of those. The minor prophets, there's 12 of those. You got 39 books in the Old Testament. Can anybody name all of those books in the Old Testament? Take a shot. Help me out with it. You just say it with me. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. That's the Pentateuch. Then we have the historical books. Who wants to start the historical books? Joshua, Judges, Ruth, 1st, 2nd Samuel, 1st, 2nd Kings, 1st, 2nd Chronicles. Say it. I can't even understand you. Say it, Dan. Ezra, Nehemiah. Very good. Then we're getting, and then you got Esther, Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and on and on and on it goes. Okay? How many of you think that you could do that? I won't put you on the spot and have you. How many of you think you could do that? Oh, there's a bunch of you. There's a bunch of you that just slipped your hand up and so said, I know how to do that. You know, it's not hard to do. In fact, if you, if you wanted to memorize all the books of the Bible, that's how you would do it categorically. You would take the first five books of the Bible. Everybody knows that. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. You may not know exactly how to pronounce them, but you could get most of them. Then when you go down through it all, you're going to have the New Testament too that has the Gospels. There's four of those. Who knows the Gospels? Say them if you know them. Very good. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. What's the historical book in the New Testament? Acts, the book of Acts. Who was it written by the book of Acts? Luke. Very good. Most people will say Paul, but it's not Paul. It's physician Luke that wrote down uh, the book of Acts, the historical books. And then the Pauline epistles. Some division on this, but we're going to keep it simple. Pauline epistles, these are the epistles that he wrote. Romans, 1st, 2nd Corinthians. Who wants to take over from there? Please. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. Keep on going. What's after that? Say it again. Keep going. First, second Timothy, Titus, Philemon, Hebrews, James. Keep on going with that. Yeah, it takes you right on through. That's good. That's helping me out. I'm seeing that you know something about that. 40, some 40 different writers. This is really a, an amazing thing. Some 40 different men from all walks of life from, and over a period of something like 1,600 years. They wrote the Bible. A lot of people don't realize that. You might say, well, I'm going to go to my local library and I'm going to find the Bible. I want the original Bible as it was given and I'd like to start reading it. Well, you probably couldn't read it to begin with. But, but beyond that, there is no such thing that exists today. There has been that. But though God breathed 66 books of the Bible that God gave to us, but it's not in existence today as it was given then. We have lots of copies of it, but we don't have the original one that was given to us. Now let me get into some of these questions that I said I was going to ask you along the way. Who knows what the oldest book of the Bible is by date, the date that it was written? Job, the book of Job. Very good. Uh, who knows what the oldest book of the Bible is by events that are recorded? Oh, come on. That's the easiest one of all. Genesis. You, that's so easy. You, thought, you were thinking he's got a trick question there because that's not Genesis. And then I've already asked you who can recite them all. Listen, here's, here's why I'm taking the time to do this. I wanted to do something out of the ordinary because I know that if I say I'm going to preach on the Bible, people can begin to look at that and say, I already know all about the Bible. You don't probably all already know about the Bible, but there's some amazing things about the, the Bible that we ought to forever and ever and ever keep in our heart. Do you know that many lives have been changed by the eternal Word of God? Did you know that? I'm going to be giving you some illustrations of that in, in this, but there's a reason why that can happen. The Bible is different than the Iliad and the Odyssey. The Bible is different from any other book that you can name because of one very special feature. And I'm going to read it to you here in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16. And here's what it says. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. We we'll call to your attention a couple of things, but the first one I want to get to your attention is all Scripture is given by, what's that word? Inspiration. That literally means that God breathed the Word into existence. We don't think He just put an idea in the minds of men and then men started writing down what they thought that idea was. He literally breathed every single word into existence. Imperative that we know that because that's the power of the Word of God. Here's what that means when it says inspired. It means it's a book that is alive. 
It's different than any book in the world. You can open up any book. Some of the, my wife is a prodigious reader. She's reading all of the time. But any of the books that she writes, they're not alive. They, they may be alive in a sense of the world, in a spiritualization kind of a sense of the world. But did you know that every time you sit down with the Bible and you open the Bible up, the author of the Bible is there to explain itself to you? Did you know that? Wouldn't that be an amazing thing that you could bring an author with you and put that author, that author right by your side? And he would say, here's what I meant when I wrote that. You got that in the Holy Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit of God, he will sit down with the believer, and he, when the believer opens the word, the Holy Spirit is there to give to you the meaning of it if you'll simply lean upon him. The Bible's very clear about that. The power of the word of God. It's alive. No other book like it. Tells you no other book has been able to tell us wh uh, where we came from, why we're here, and where we're going. It explains all of life. It explains it to us. Now, having read that to you, I also want to bring to your attention that, that very first word, which, was, which is all, all, A-L-L. -L. Now, this is very important. We believe that every single word of the Bible is inspired by God. Not just the paragraphs. Every single word is inspired by God. That's really important for us to understand because it comes into play in a whole lot of ways. So it's inspired meaning that it's alive, and we, we understand that it's alive because every single word makes it what it is. Now listen to this in Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12. One of, one of the powerful scriptures that tells us so much about the word of God. It says, for the word of God, it uses the, the old English word there is quick. Quick means alive. For the word of God is alive. The word of God is alive and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of the soul and the spirit, and of the joints, and the marrow, listen to this now, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. When I stand to preach, it has very little to do with my charisma or my understanding of the Word of God. That all comes into play, and I'm not talk, taking away from it. But, but if you want the Word of God to impact your life, it takes the Holy Spirit of God to do that, to take the Word of God, and because the Word of God discerns it breaks down. It, 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 it causes you to be able to see what's going on in your own mind and your own thoughts. It can reveal those things to you. No other book can do that. No other book can do that. In fact, he further claims that all, every single word being inspired, because of that inspiration, it means that it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Now, I'm very tempted to get into the various details of that and explain it to you, but that, this is where we get our doctrine from. We have no business having any doctrine unless it comes from the Word of God. Now, there may be divisions that people can have on that, minor divisions. I would certainly hope that would be, but it's very important. But here's the basis that I want to give to you, because this is where the rubber meets the road for you. Some of you that are sitting here this morning, you're saying, well, Brother Satan, I've heard you say, and I'm going to say it again today, that the Bible has the answer to every question that man has. The Bible has the answer to every question that man has. Now, looking across our congregation, we have a pretty, pretty full house here today. I would imagine, and, and with me knowing as a pastor and being involved in some of your lives, I know this is true. I'm not necessarily preaching to you, but at the same time I am. There's all kinds of problems that are represented in this room this morning. If we expand that out to the radio where this message will be on at 4 o'clock today on WRBK, and we expand it even further on the Internet, which goes worldwide and it stays on there for a long, long time, uh, as well as the television ministry that we have, there's all kinds of people that are out there. You're telling me that the Bible has the answer to all of my problems in life? Well, i got a rotten marriage, and I, I don't know how to make it work. Where would you turn in the Bible? To deal with marriage. Does it have anything to say about it? You're going to be preaching kind of along those lines tonight. Hints for husbands, I saw. Listen to me. Do you know that in 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 1 through 6, it tells women how they can best be wives? Did, did you know the Bible teaches that? Did you know that the Bible in 1, 1 Peter chapter 3, beginning in verse 7, starts with the word likewise, talking about submission with the women? He's also saying, men, you need to also be in subjection to the women. They should be in subjection to you and you to them. In fact, let me go on and say, he says, we ought to be in subjection to one another. It's a principle of life. And so somebody comes in and they begin talking about, I've got problems in my marriage, and, and some of these things are pretty intimate stuff. I mean, what do I do when we get into these intimate areas? The Bible surely doesn't talk about intimate things, really. 
Did you know that one of the most powerful scriptures is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 7? It is good for a man not to touch a woman, nevertheless to avoid fornication. Let every man have his own wife and let every woman have her own husband. The husband has not power over his own body but the wife. And likewise, the wife does not have power over her own body but the husband. Let them render kindnesses one to another. Now, I'm paraphrasing there when I get to that. He says, he brings, he, my point's very clear. If you've got marriage problems and you really want your marriage to work, just get in the Word of God. We'll help guide you in that, and it will tell you exactly what you need to do. I've had people sit in my office and say, wow, I had no idea that the Bible could do that. I had no idea that the Bible even said that. It's good to see Katie and Derek here. They're my most recent where we did their ceremony. It seems like forever ago now. How long have you guys been married? Three months. Has it been that long? Three months. There's so many good things that I see about them that please me. And listen to premarital counseling. You go through all. You go through as much as you can of what the Bible says about marriage and how it works. Because those of us who have been married for a long time, we know that no matter how much you love that beautiful bride you have, no matter how much she loves that handsome groom that she has, there's going to be testings in their home right along the way. The Bible has the answer. That's why when Satan pulls you away from here, do you know what he's trying to do? He's trying to isolate you, get you away from the Word of God, because if he wants to do a number on your marriage, he's going to get you out of here where there's a good influence. Not to mention the many other influences that can be in your life. A lot of people come in and say, well, how do you, how do you raise kids? I mean, I'm having all kinds of... i got a kid that's on drugs. I'm not saying I have a kid on drugs, you understand. I'm saying people come in and say that. i got a kid on drugs, or I've got this problem, i got that problem. They're no, they're no good in school. They're not making any kind of passing grades, and I'm having real difficulties that are involved. Where would you go? The Bible says, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he's older, he will not depart from it. That means establish patterns in that kid's life, and when that kid becomes an adult, the patterns will still be there. You know, a lot of people don't understand exactly what that means, but what he's saying is, if you raise a child to be a spoiled brat, there'll be a 70-year-old spoiled rat unless God intervenes. Do you understand what he's saying? Develop patterns. Capture their heart. Write upon their heart the patterns that God wants them to have. It's what the Word of God teaches. And then some people will even get down to some of the details. Very, very sensitive matter. You mean to tell me that the Bible talks about how to handle your money? Wow. The Bible says more about money than it does most other subjects in the Bible. Did you know that? What would you say to someone who comes in and they say, you know, we're having some real, we're having some real money problems. Some of you probably are having money problems. We're not trying to belittle you in, in any way, but what, what does the Bible teach about that? Where would you take somebody? To, do you, would you go to the Bible at all? Does the Bible have anything to say about that? You know, a real good place to start is Luke chapter 6 and verse 38. In fact, I saw in the bulletin today, and one of the things that we're doing, Luke chapter 6 and verse 38. Do you know what it says? Give, 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 and it shall be given unto you, good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, shall men give into your bosom, for with the same measure that you meet with it shall be measured to you again. We could go to the Old Testament, the book of Malachi, when he says, bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse and see if I'll not open the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing so great there won't even be room enough to contain it. See, all that the Word of God does is it takes us back to God. Every single time it takes us back to God. And that's what this book is all about. It's all about God. Not only that, but you get into other areas like sickness. Sam brought it up in Sunday school, and all of us have had it on the news very recently. Very sincere man, I'm sure, that picked up that rattlesnake in eastern Kentucky and it bit him. And he wouldn't go to the doctor to get the kind of help they need because that's, that violated his convictions. And he died. He died. Now his 20, 23-year-old son, I think, has taken over pastoring the church. And he, uh, right away, in one of the first services afterward, he handled the very snake, rattlesnake, that had bitten his father and killed him. Well, how do you, how do you clarify that? They claim they're getting that from the Word of God, you know. How, how do you deal with that? What do you do when people are sick? When people come in and say, well, I don't believe in doctors. I'm not going to doctors. You know, that's in violation of the word of God. Listen to this as I read it to you. James chapter 5, starting in verse 14. I love how God does this. He, he asks a question. Is any sick among you? You know, the idea that he's giving you, you got somebody who's really seriously sick? Somebody who's really hurting? He says, here's what I want you to do. Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him. Now, here's what I want you to see anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. 
Do you know that oil was the medication of that day? That was the medicine that they used. Let me go on reading here. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up. Now, I want to tell you, that's pretty exact. What it's teaching us, in essence, is that we are to take the medication that the doctor gives to us and the advice the doctor gives to us and the instructions that the doctor gives to us. He's in, involving that all in that word oil there. He says, I, I want you to do all of that and then pray because all healing comes from God. I'm, I thank God for doctors. We've got good doctors. We've got a lot of good nurses right here in our church. And, and I want to tell you something. We're, we're glad that they're there. But healing comes from God doesn't come from man. It comes from God. And God has chosen to do it in this way. So we have our instructions there with such a thing as that. And then I know you, you know the answer to this. I said to that group that I was preaching to yesterday and, and the devotions, the three devotions that I brought, what do you do when you're hurt? You know, I can ask this question and it would be kind of redundant. I can guarantee you that right now every single person that's listening to me, not just here in the auditorium but all of these other medias, you have been hurt in your life. And some of you, your life is on standstill because you can't get over the hurt. Still there. It's something that haunts you all of the time. You dream about that incident, the person that, whose face really hurt you. you. You look at that individual in your mind's eye and you can't get away from it. You just constantly have the pressure that comes. You mean to tell me that, that something as psychologically hard as that, you, the Bible has the answer to that? Yeah, it does. The Bible has the ultimate answer of that. Do you know what it is? Who wants to say it? Oh, I know you know what it is. Forgive. 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 Who is hurt when you, when you refuse to forgive? Who is it that's hurt the most? The one who won't forgive. It eats them up on the inside. They refuse to let go of what somebody has done to them. And the result of that is it just eats away at them. And the Bible says, you want to be free? All you got to do when someone hurts you, forgive them. Brother Satan, they haven't asked me to forgive them. doesn't make any difference. The Bible teaches whether they ask or they never do ask. You are all ready to have forgiven them in your heart. The Bible has everything that we need to be able to do what we need to do. And that fact ought to give us great encouragement. Now I want to read you, lighten up just a little bit on this. I read this and I just absolutely love it. I like it when people want to try and live by the word of God. And I read a story about a seminary student who wanted to have a scriptural basis for everything that he did. You've got to find that a very noble thing. And he felt that he was on solid ground. If he could just quote the, uh, the book of, of the Bible and the, the verse and, 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 t and say, this is why I practice this in my life. And so he did all right until he began to fall in love with a beautiful co-ed. Here he was. Wanted very much to kiss her after dating her several times. But he just couldn't find a scripture that said it was all right to kiss her. And so he struggled and he struggled and he struggled and he, and he really wanted to do something. And, and, and he took her back home to her dormitory and she stood there and she was standing at the front door. And he was saying what a great time he had that night and... And he really wanted to kiss her, but he said, you know, that I just can't find in the Bible where God will permit me to kiss her until we're married. And, and, and so I, I just can't, can't do it. And he was struggling away and having a hard time. And so he would say, well, I had a, a great night. And he would just shake her hand, and she'd go inside and come out. Guy's nuts, I think. He, you don't need to have a lot of stuff on here. But he, but he did. Then one day he was reading, and he found in the book of Romans, found the answer that he was looking for. Greet each other with a holy kiss. And he thought about it. At last, I have a scriptural authority for kissing her good night. But to be sure, he went to his hermeneutics professor. That's somebody who deals in the Bible. And the hermeneutics professor said, look, I, I don't want to discourage you, but well, when I check this out, after talking with you about all of this, you need to realize that this passage deals more with a church setting than it does with a dating situation. He was really discouraged. And so that evening he had a date with her and he, and he took her out again. He just was falling in love with this girl and he really wanted to kiss her and, and he just couldn't find the scripture to do it. And this girl knew that he was trying to live by the scripture and admired the fact that he was, but she was frustrated too. And there they were standing once again in front of the dormitory and, 
and he, and he wants to kiss her, but he can't kiss her, and he reaches out to shake her hand, and she grabs him, kind of like my wife did when she got back from Florida, and grabs him by the collar and drags him across to her and, and says, and just kisses him for about 10, 15 seconds, big old smooch right on the lips. And, and before he could do anything at all, he said, Scripture, Scripture, and she said, Scripture, and she grabbed him again, and she pulled him in close to her, and she said, here's the Scripture, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Every dad who has a daughter doesn't like that illustration, I can guarantee you. You know, one of the reasons I threw it in was to lighten things up because we deal with heavy stuff. We do. We Christians deal with really heavy stuff. There's people in here trying to decide what they're going to do in certain situations in their life right now. They're really important. There's other people seeing Mary sitting back here having gone through all the treatments that she's gone through. We've missed her. So glad that she's back with us. Can you imagine? Whatever's going wrong in your life, all of a sudden you go to the doctor and he says, listen, I got some bad news for you. You got cancer. Your whole world stops. All your plans change. How am I going to break this to my family? What am I going to be doing? See, so think life can change over just like that. Life can change overnight. Now, I want to share some other things with you about the Bible. I'm not going to take very long with this, but these are just elementary things. You can get in much greater depth if you want to, but... Here's the reasons that you ought to trust the Bible. Not because I say so. Not because of any ability that I might have to bring the word of God across to you, but just two areas that I want to bring to your attention. One of them is prophecy. Prophecy is one of the greatest things that prove the Bible is the eternal word of God. Did you know that? We've all heard about the predictions of Nostradamus. Nostradamus was a French spiritist who lived in the 1500s. But if you look at his predictions, they're so, they're so vague that just about anybody could make the predictions that he makes. And, and then you all knew about Jean Dixon, who I don't think she's alive today, but Jean Dixon, she claimed that she had something like an 80 or 85% um, accuracy rate in all the predictions that she made. And once again, she had just vague things that were there. Did, did you know that if Nostradamus had lived during the time of Christ, and, and in particular in the time of the Old Testament, if Jean Dixon had lived in the time of the Old Testament and she was said 85% accuracy, do you know what they would have done to her back in that day? They would have stoned her to death as a fake prophet. Because a prophet in the Old Testament in particular, if he made a prophecy, that was assumed that it came directly from God, the only one that can see into the future what's going to happen. And they would stone those people to death because they accepted them as frauds and not as real. So God puts himself on the spot and says, I'm going to tell you things that are going to happen in the future, not in vague general ways where just anybody could. I'm going to tell you specifically how things are going to happen. Now, where would we go for that? It probably would do you good if you want to turn to this, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 13, because here's one of the predictions that he makes. God says, this is a, this is a prediction. I believe one of the next things to happen. God says, are you listening? Stay with me. God says there's a generation coming that is never going to die. Did you know the Bible teaches that? There's a generation coming that is never going to die. Now, I don't mind telling you I'd like to be in that generation. I'm not looking forward to death. It's my enemy. I know where I'm going, but I, I want to do away with death. I want to go to heaven without dying. If there's a way of doing that, I want to do it. Listen to this. I, I love to read this when I read it to uh, in funerals because I realize I've got lost people there that don't know a lot of these things. And I'm also aware that some of you may not be aware of it. And I know that there's a lot of people that are here that are seasoned people in the Word of God, seasoned Christians, and, and you know these things. He says, but I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep. That means the dead. I don't want you to sorrow uh, as, as those who do not have any hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus, God will bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not precede them which are asleep. Do you, do you know what he's saying there? There's a day coming when God's going to come back in the clouds 
And he's going to call out of the, out of the grave the bodies that have been, uh, been put there or, or, or been in an ocean or eaten by a shark. You can call, look anywhere you want. This is God we're talking about who created the earth and spoke it into existence. And he says, there's a time coming when I'll call those bodies out of the grave, unite them with the souls that are in heaven, and you which are alive and remain, I'm going to call you and you're going to come up into the clouds, body, soul, and spirit with a brand new focused body that has nothing to do with any kind of sin. Now, that's what he teaches us. Did you know that? I remember one of the first times I heard this preach. I was, I was just a teenager. Uh, Donna lived in Winton Terrace. I lived in Norwood in Cincinnati. And so I'd take the church bus home with her and spend the evening or whatever we had together there. And, and then I'd hitchhike home for about 10 miles, whatever it was, over to Norwood. I'd hitchhike my way home. And... and Church was on my mind heavy when I do that on Sundays because we'd go there Sunday night and we'd go to church and then come out and then I'd hitchhike home. And when I would come home, my sister, I had six sisters and a brother. Not all of them were at home, but a lot of them were. Linda, who was just a year younger than me, she slept in what would have been a dining room, but we turned it into a bedroom. I had to go right through her bedroom to get to my room. And I love my sister and I still love her. And she was in bed and I climbed in bed with her. And I said, I've got to tell you something that I learned tonight in church. And she said, can't it wait till tomorrow? I said, you know what? I'm afraid it can't. I said, I'm going to tell you something, Linda. If I disappear and you don't know where I'm at, get saved. Because it means I'm gone. What are you talking about, she said. I said, I learned tonight in church that the Bible teaches that there's going to be an entire generation that's not going to die. God's going to call them straight up to be with him. She said, you're nuts. You're in some kind of a crazy religion. Can you understand how people would think that? Listen, this is in the Bible. This is what God said he's going to do. This is an amazing thing. If God makes a claim, stop and think about that. Why would he make a claim like that if it's not true? That's an amazing thing that he's saying there. We get into other areas, and I'm not going to spend any time there, and I didn't even put the scripture down because I don't want to take the time with it. But did you know that we look around, you've been watching probably Russia, and you've been watching the Ukraine and what's, what all's going on there and, and the stuff like that. What, I wonder what's going to happen on the world scene. What is Obama going to do to our economy, and if we don't get him out of there soon, what, what's going to happen? Did you know the Bible has the answers to those things? It does. It has the answers. The Bible says, listen, there's going to be wars and rumors of wars. Let me tell you about one specific war that's going to happen. We're not done with Russia yet. Russia, with their, their allies, is going to come against the nation of Israel to, to wipe them off of the face of the earth. Who are they going to be? It tells us very clearly in the Word of God who it's going to be. It's going to be Russia with her allies, Iran, Ethiopia, Libya, Germany, Turkey. They're going to all come together. Did you know that Iran, not too long ago, just in the early 50s, they were one of the greatest allies that the United States had? Did you know that Turkey was a great ally of the United States? But not anymore. Just like God said, they're going to unite with Russia, come against Israel, and I'm going to intervene, God says, and I'm going to stop them from wiping out Israel. Now, God does it specifically. He tells us who those nations are. That's the word of God that you hold in your hand. He says, don't worry too much because there's an evil leader that's going to be coming. That evil leader is known as Antichrist, and he's going to do terrible things. He's going to demand that the entire world bows down and worships him. And he's going to put a mark on their forehead or a mark on their hand. And that's how you'll buy and sell. That's how you'll live. It will be a moneyless system that's going to be going on. The Bible gives us all of that stuff. Now listen to me. Since the Bible was written by God, it's perfect. It was written by God, so it's perfect. Every answer that we need in our lives... He has it. And you can count on it as being totally and completely trustworthy. You remember I, I said this book is alive a little while ago? As powerful as the evidence of prophecy is, there's a greater, more powerful evidence that the Bible is what it claims to be. Do you know what that is? That Jesus Christ is alive today. It's the greatest evidence of the truth of the word of God there is. Now listen to me. He said, they're going to put me in a grave. And I'll stay there for a period of time, three days and three nights. But I'm coming out of that grave and I'm going to conquer death. And I will live 
on the right hand of my Father in heaven above. He's alive today. And as we say around Easter every time, if Jesus Christ is not alive, you and I are the biggest fools on the face of the earth. But he is alive. And he's present right here in this auditorium this morning. Wanting to bear witness with your heart about what needs to be done in your life. Answering for you the questions that if you'll just look, if you'll just look. One of the reasons you need to come to church, he'll answer them. He'll answer them. Listen to this, if you will. Let me have your attention. If you're someone who has never trusted Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, this is a great reason why you ought to trust him. And it gives you a confirmation of exactly what you need to do. If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and will believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Now listen to me. Listen to me. Will you believe that Jesus Christ was not just a mere man? He was a mere man, but he was God in the flesh. 100% God, 100% man. If you'll believe that Jesus Christ was God who came among us, and, and you'll believe that he died upon a cross of Calvary, was buried in a grave, and he conquered death and came out of that grave, and, and uh, revealed himself to many people, 500 people at once, he said, if you'll believe that, knowing that you're a sinner, he said, I'll save you. It's that simple. I'll save you. And when he saves you, he'll change you. No such thing as, as being saved and not being changed. I want to finish with this illustration. A preacher stood on the street corner preaching to anyone who would listen to him. I don't know if any of you have ever done that. I've preached on street corners. Did it a good bit when I was a teenager. I'd go down to Government Square in Cincinnati, and I'd, I'd preach to the top of my lungs with a little PA system that I carried along with me, and my buddy, he'd pass out tracks. More tracks on the, on the ground than anybody had ever took them home with them, but it was good for us. We went out there and we preached the gospel so that everybody could hear it. This preacher, he did the same thing. He'd go around and he'd make his rounds and preaching on the street corner. And a, a man approached him as he stood there listening to him. He looked like he'd been homeless for a long period of time. And the preacher looked at him as he approached him and he said, Can I help you? And the guy looked at him and he said, Well, I think you can. And the homeless man stood there for just a second and he said, Well, what would you like me to do? The preacher said, You want me to tell you about Jesus? He said, no, I really don't want to hear about Jesus. And he said, well, how about if I pray for you? Would you like me to pray for you? Is that why you're coming here to me? And he said, no, I really don't want you to pray for me. He said, well, what is it you want from me? He said, I want your Bible. You want my Bible. Why do you want my Bible? He said, I notice the pages of your Bible are super thin. And I can roll up my tobacco or my joints in that paper, and it lasts me a long time because that's a pretty thick Bible. Well, at first the preacher's insulted by that, and he doesn't think he's going to do it, but God intervened and spoke to his heart and said, give him your Bible. And so he did. He gave him his Bible. He said, I'm going to give you my Bible, but you've got to promise you'll do this one thing. Every single time you tear a page out that you're going to wrap up your tobacco or your joint in, I want you to promise me that before you roll it up in that, you're going to read it. He said, all right, I'll do that. Time went by, about three four months went by, and he came back to that same street corner, and he started preaching again, and this guy walks up to him, neat and clean, and he says to him, look at me, he says, do you know me? And he said, no, I've never met you before in my life. He said, yeah, you have. He said, you gave me your Bible four or five months ago. He said, I gave you my Bible? What happened to you? Tell me what happened to you. He said, well, it's, it's really pretty simple. You see, I, I started reading it like I promised you I would. And I, I got to the book of Matthew, and he said, I read all the way through the book of Matthew. Smoked my way through Matthew is what I did. And he said, I smoked my way through Mark, and I smoked my way through Luke. And then I came to the gospel of John, and the gospel of John smoked me. And do you know what he was saying? The word of God began to penetrate his heart. We're saved by the word of God. And this man had a change that came about in his life. This book is alive. And when we share it with people, it does its work. It convicts. It draws. And it's speaking to you right now.
Some of you have been thinking about trusting Christ as your Savior for quite some time. It's time you did it. Some of you have other decisions that you need to make in your life. It's time that you did it. Let's all stand together with our heads bowed and eyes closed. Dan, get us ready for this invitation, please. Father, your eternal word, we love it. Sometimes that seems strange to me because sometimes when I read your word, it, it's like a hammer. And I feel like you're just beating me up with that hammer. There's other times when I read your word, Father, that all of a sudden there's a still, small voice, lovingly, drawing me to the truths of your word. And I know that every single person listening to me now that's a Christian, they understand what I'm talking about, how your word is alive, how it speaks to us according to the needs of our own heart. And Father, I pray that you will meet every single need that is here today by turning them to your word, letting them see the great insights that you have. But most of all, Father, we want to intercede for that one that has never trusted Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. How easy to do that. The promise of your word is that it would not return void, but it will accomplish that that you intended to accomplish. And I pray that soul that is seeking right now and wants to be saved, that they'll come forward in church and let us know about that. They'll take Brother Jeremy by the hand and simply say to him, I want to be saved today. For my dear brothers and my sisters in Christ, I pray that they'll be washed with your word, that we will draw closer and closer to you until every thought is brought under the obedience of the Lord Jesus Christ. Above all, receive honor and glory in this invitation. In Christ's name we do pray. Amen. Let's sing together. What is the number, Dan? 482. 482. Jesus is tenderly calling you home, calling today. sings this to us. Jesus is calling Are you sure that you need to leave the way you're leaving? You can leave here today with your heart clean, in touch with God, certain of your home in heaven for sure, forever. Simply comes by believing upon the Lord Jesus Christ. Greatest weapon of Satan is delay. Delay. He's spoken to your heart and you need to come. We're waiting for you to do that now. Please come. Please come right now. Find the aisle closest to you. We'll meet you here in the front.